Microsoft Power Automate Desktop lets you automate websites, Excel, Outlook, files, and everything else on your computer. The best part is that it's done with drag and drop actions and low code. Here's how to learn Power Automate Desktop the best way as a beginner. First, we will install Power Automate Desktop, so please open up a browser. And even though you already have installed it either through the Microsoft Store or it's pre-installed in your Windows 11, please install it again with me. Then we'll make sure that it's set up the right way. First, you navigate to google.com. Then you want to do a search for Power Automate Desktop Download. Hit enter. Pick the link from Microsoft Learn, most likely the first one. It's called Install Power Automate. Then we scroll a little bit down and take the Download the Power Automate Installer. That will download the executable up here in the right corner. Once that is done, we click Open File. That will start the installation process for Power Automate Desktop. Then you click Next. You can agree to the terms of use. And once I click Install here, my screen will go black for a couple of seconds. And that's because I need to click Yes. This installation process will take anywhere between 5 to 120 seconds. So if yours is a little bit slow, just lean back and make it finish. Then we need to install extensions. So install extensions for the, for the browsers you have installed on your computer, either Chrome, Edge or Firefox or multiple of these. If you prefer like one of them, just pick that one and install the extension. I will install it for Chrome and Edge, but it's equally as good to use Firefox. Here I'll just say add to Chrome, add extension. That has been installed in Chrome. I can now automate Chrome. I'll also use it in Edge. So I'll click here and I'll say get, add extension. We have installed it in Edge as well. Similarly for Firefox, if I, if I prefer that browser. You can follow this guide uh, no matter what browser you use. So we click launch after installing the extensions. This is the Power Automate desktop homepage in the application. If this is not in English, you need to install the English language. You can do that by following the video up here in the right corner and then come back to this video. If it's in English, all good. Let's get started. So let me open up this here. In my flows, I have the previously built flows. We don't have any. Don't worry, we will build everything today. I'll click new flow up here. We're going to create your first flow. Call this one recorder example, and then hit create. Now we have created our first flow. It's blank. We have the co-pilot out here to the right. We will use co-pilot later in this video. It's a very cool feature bit more advanced, so I close it for now. In the middle here, where you see you don't have any actions here yet, here we drag and drop actions in. And these actions, once we click Run, performed sequentially. So one by one, that could be open up a browser, click an element, download some data, save that data to Excel, email that Excel uh, with in an email in Outlook. A very simple process. The beauty of this is that we can drag and drop these actions in, and these actions you can find them here to the left in categories. For example, I can open up the browser automation category and to open up a browser, I can either choose Firefox, Chrome or Edge, never use Internet Explorer, that one is not secure. I prefer Chrome at the moment, so I drag in Chrome. Here I need to fill out a few parameters. I can choose to launch a new instance that will open up a new, new browser window or I can attach it to a running instance, say that I already have opened up a browser window, either manually or early in the flow. I'll pick the launch new instance. In case you want to know more, you can either click more info here, that will open up the documentation for the action. Um, let me close here. Or you can also hover your mouse over this information over here. Then it says specify whether to launch a new instance of Chrome or attach to an existing one. That has a little bit guide here. Then we need a URL. And let me first open up Chrome. And with Chrome or whatever browser you have, try to navigate to anasjensen.org. If you see this pop up, simply just make a selection. First, we'll do this manually. That is just to avoid this pop up, but you can easily automate this as well. 
So now I am here on the site, I'm opening up the site, I want to click courses and extract some data. So let us do that. And the first thing is that the URL is anasjensen.org. That was the web page that we wanted to automate. The window state is normal. This is the size that we previously closed the browser in. We can also choose to maximize the browser or minimize. Normal is fine. Here it's important to say that we are automating through addresses, also known as selectors, at least per default. That means that it doesn't matter how big or small the window is. We are not using coordinates and we are not using images per default. So you can just pick either normal or maximized. Then this browser instance is safe in a variable called browser. And if I click in here, I can see that a variable starts with a percentage sign and ends with the percentage sign. So when we refer to a variable, we need to have a percentage sign in the start and in the end. This is clever because this variable called browser store all the information about this browser window that we're just about to open. That means that we can come back to this window later on in the flow by referring to this name. Here I click save. So let me try to click run. We are opening up the website. Now I want to click courses and I also want to get some information out. And here, let's say it's the first time that we use Power Automate Desktop. It can be hard to find, find out which one of these actions over here to the left. So what you can do is to use the recorder. Click recorder up here. The recorder captures user actions such as click with your mouse or keyboard typings interactions with other applications or websites. Then it translates these actions into Power Automate desktop actions and that these actions can be executed. So we don't need to know any actions. I just need to record my own steps. So what you will do here is to press record. Now it's recording everything. That does also mean that if I you can see, I can choose elements in the browser. That also means that if I move this window a little bit down, you can see I have a move window here. I don't want to automate that I move the window a bit. So I click a spin here to delete that recording. What I want to automate is this courses. So once I'm over courses and I can see this red one, I click the courses. And here you can see that we have a launch web browser and a click element. In case you have some slightly other actions, that's okay. Sometimes Power Automate Desktop translate to different actions. They do the same but they are, uh, they are different. Don't, don't worry. I also want to extract all of this data. So I pick the outer div. You can see div up here in the left corner, but I go red around it. Now it disappeared. So once I have clicked here, I need to, not clicked, I hover the mouse. Then I can right click with the mouse. I repeat, right click, say extract the element value and just click anywhere in here on all this text. Then we are extracting all the elements in here. Yes, they will be a little bit messy. We will do data gymnastics later in the course. So once that is done, I click done. And now you can see we had this launch new Chrome. We did that ourselves. And then we have a comment here saying start of auto generated actions using the recorder. These blue ones here in two and seven, these are comments. We can use these comments to comment our code and that makes it easily understandable when we or our colleague come back to it later. I can also open it. So try click the number two. You can say start of auto generated actions using the recorder. I can edit this. So for example, I can just do this just to show you that when I click save, it update the comment. I don't need these comments. These are not really informable when I come back. I don't care if I use the recorder or not. So I can click on this action. Then I can hold control in with on my keyboard, click the other one. Then I have marked both. These are the same ones, the control that you use in other programs. Then hit delete on your keyboard. They disappear. You can also right click and click delete. Here we can see that the recorder also said, well, um, you are, uh, you're launch attaching, you're launching a new Chrome. And this time you can see here, I attach to Chrome instead of launching. That's because I didn't know that we already have it opened. So I can just say delete to this. Then we clicked on the link courses and then we navigate to anasjensen.org courses. We could, of course, we could just navigate to this 
URL in the beginning instead of clicking. But because I want to demonstrate how we click here, let's just delete this go to web page if you have it. Then finally, we have this get details of element on web page where we extract the data. So shouldn't we go test the automation? So here I click run. So here you can see I click courses and I also get the details of element on web page. If I do this, then what I want to see here is that in the lower left corner, we have a green check mark. That means that our automation ran successfully. If you see an error message down below, you have done something wrong. Please repeat the step. For now, it's good. So I go over here to these variables. In case you don't see this variable, it might look like this. Simply just click the sexy variables and you will find the variables used in this flow. We have the browser. That one got created up here. And in this action, get details of element on web page, we created a variable called inner text. And if I double click here on advanced AI and these ones here, I have all the text extracted. I couldn't write this out to a text file or an Excel file. I know it's a little bit a big mess, but it's a start. We have done our first web extraction. So far, so good. Now we're going to get more advanced. Let us first save this flow. There's no auto save in Power Automate Desktop. That also means that you need to remember to save your flows. Because let's imagine that we work on this, we minimize it for a couple of hours, and then we just shut down uh, Windows forcefully, then these flows will disappear. So remember to save. If I try to exit it, there'll also be this pop up where it prompts me to save. I can just click save here. Then it's saved and it exited. We will build a new flow now, but congratulations, you built your first flow. You're about to become an RPA developer. And we can find that flow here in my flows. And when I want to come back, I can hit this edit. And if I run this flow, I don't need to open it. I can also press this play button that will also run the flow. We want to create a new flow. So I go up here in the left corner. So even though I'm here in my flows, I can also find it at home, that one here in uh, that new flow here or here or here. So I click new flow. And here we will call it port folio, let me just portfolio case, and I'll click create. I prepared a case for you today that involves that we're going to read an Excel sheet, we're going to iterate the values in this Excel sheet, we're going to do browser automation, browser extraction, we're going to create some real advanced calculations and visualization, we will also make Power Automate Desktop draw charts in Excel. We're going to email these things. We're going to work with files and everything. I prepared it step by step. So we take one step at a time very slowly. It will teach you everything about Power Automate Desktop. So it's important that you follow these steps and you build it. Then you learn much faster instead of just passively watching. Anyway, we have this flow and let me close the copilot again. I don't have to, but then it's a more clean look. Let's navigate to the course materials. I can close these ones down as well, just for now at least. The course materials, you should download those. Those are in a zip format. So once you have downloaded either to your desktop or to your downloads folder, right click on them, say extract all. And here, let us just download it to our desktop in a folder called project. Feel free to place it somewhere else, for example, uh, on another drive, another drive where you will save it. I'll click extract and we have uh, unzipped the project here. I can double click it. We have a case A and a case B. Let's work with case A as a start. So I double click this and in here I can see I have an input folder. Double click to open that and I double click the portfolio. This is our Excel sheet that we will automate as a start. What I want to do here is to read all the data. And here we can see that this is our position. We are somewhat rich. So, and this is of course sample data. It's not my personal wealth, I wish. But here I have a name, a ticker, a buying price, current price, quantity, total cost, market value, and profit loss. We also have some assets down here from Apple to Paramount. We have their tickets, that is the unique code. We can use that for search. We have what we gave for them in buying price and how many we own. Then we, for each one of these rows, 
I want to navigate to a web page. I can choose the uh, Google Finance and I will web scrape the current price and add it to Excel, right back to Excel. Once that is done, I want to do the calculations of all this data. So I want to calculate the cost. The cost is the buying price times quantity. The market value will be the current price times quantity. And then the profit loss, that will be market value minus total cost. And then we want to do a visualization. I want to make a pie chart and I'm using Copilot for that. But one step at a time, we will set everything up. So for now, I will just close this one, go back to um, this folder here called case A. So if I go back here to my project where I have the case A and case B, if you're on Windows 11, just right click on case A. If you're on Windows 10, hold shift on your keyboard and click right click the folder. Then you'll find this copy as path. Go click it. We have the path in our clipboard. And then we go back to Power to Make Desktop to our empty flow. So we are going to store this path in a variable. A variable is a container for a value. A variable has a name which we can refer to and then we can retrieve a value. So if I go up here and say set variable, I can initialize a variable, drag it in. Here we give it a name. Never call a variable new var. That's default. It's very bad practice to not name your variables well. This means that it will also get easier to come back to the flow if we name our variables well and something that says something about the data. Since this is, since this is our project path, we'll name it that. You can also see that I name it to the Pascal naming convention. That means that I start each word with a capital letter. That's also the way Microsoft names its variable here in Power to Make Desktop. So please follow that standard. Of course, feel free to change it if you have a good reason to. Then we go down here in value. And here I say control V to paste in the path. We don't need the quotation marks in Power Automate Desktop. So I delete those. We will use this path later on in the flow. So here I click save. Now we're going to launch an Excel instance. That means that we will open up the Excel book. So go search for a launch. And when I do this and not find them in the categories, this is just because you will get used to these names so fast. Here I can also just say launch. I can search for Excel and then find the launch Excel. This is the way you will work after this guide. Trust me, you have learned these actions one, once this guide is done. Let's drag in the launch Excel. So now I can open up a blank document. That is fine if I want to start a blank Excel sheet and start filling in things. But we want to opening up the following document. Here it's important when you automate Excel files in Power Automate Desktop that you have closed the Excel file. So if you have it open down here below, please close it. Otherwise, it will fail and it will probably lock your Excel book until you have restarted or closed it forcefully. Then we want to say what document path should I use? I just created a variable at least for the first part of the path. So let's use this variable. I could say percentage sign. Then I can say project path and a percent sign. This will be perfectly fine to refer at least to the first part here um, of the path. But a better way is that once you have an input text box is that anytime you see this X, click it and double click the variable that you're going to use. That's because, of course, we're lazy. We are automation developers, but it's also to avoid errors. So we don't have any spelling mistakes or anything. Then I also need to navigate to the input subfolder. So I'll have a backward slash and I'll say input. And then I need to specify the file name of the Excel book. That one was called portfolio.xlsx. Again, it's important to spell right. It's programming. So if you don't have spelled the extension right, this xlsx, then your automation will fail. We can choose to make the instance visible. That might be fine if you want to see what's going on. I don't need it right now, so I disable it. I can also choose to open it as read only. That is fine if we're not going to save data back into the document. We are that, so we cannot take that one. At least we do that later on. Scroll a little bit down and here you can see this variables produced is called Excel instance. 
we can refer to this Excel instance when we want to refer to this Excel book. That also means that we can give it another name and then we can open up another Excel book, give that a second name, and we can have two Excel books open at the same time. We sometimes need that when we want to compare it or move data from one Excel to another. Anyway, we click Save. Now we can read the data. We just open up the book here. Now we can read a single sheet. So to do so, you will find a read from Excel worksheet and drag it in. Here you can see we work in the Excel instance. And because we only have one Excel instance, Power to Make Desktop just auto fill it in here. If we had more, we can find the other instances in this dropdown and we can pick between them. We can choose to read a single cell, a range, or in our case, all available values from the worksheet. We will just read all data. What you need to do now is to click advanced and we need to indicate that we have headers in our data set. And we do that in first line of range contains column names, hit that. And yes, it's a little bit annoying that it's hidden so well. I think it should be default up but, and that's because I always have headers on my data, at least like 99% of the times. Here we produce a variable called Excel data. Now we can maybe add a little bit to it. I will have a position. And this is because position. This is because this is my position. This will be a table, a data table. So what we will do here is to read our Excel data into a data table. And that's because it's better, it's easier and faster to work with it than just opening up an Excel book, work with it in the UI and do clicks and all this. So we read it into a data table and a data table also got rows and columns and almost, um, almost um, appear as the same as an Excel book and that's convenient. First you click save here. We also need to close the instance. So every time we have launched an Excel instance, we also need to close it. So I go up here, say close, and then have a close Excel. For now, we will not save any data. Of course, we will save data back because we're going to web scrape data to it, but one step at a time. So here we just close it like this. Then we can run it. And what I want to see here once I click run is that we don't get any errors, that we launch the Excel, we read it, and we also close the Excel. That's it. So that's the first success. I also want to see 10 rows and eight columns over here. So if I double click here, here we have our data. And I told you that a data table behaved a lot like an Excel book. You can see we have rows and columns. The only thing that differs, that is that we have this header row here in Excel. This is row one. But in a data table, this is not a row per se, this is just a header row. The first data row is index zero, and that's because it's zero indexed. And this also means that it behaves a little bit different than the Excel sheet. Let me open up the Excel sheet. Let me resize it so we have it here. And here you can see that in a data table, the first data row is index zero. In Excel, it's the second row, so it's two ahead in the Excel. So once we read it into a data table, there's no link between the Excel and data table. Of course, it's easy to see that we just need to, that row zero here equals two row two here. We will fix that later on. Once we have data, we want to write back to Excel. So now I can close, but, and let me also open up the Excel book once more. Let me go to another sheet called Anasiensen Org. Try to do this, and this is just data about me. For example, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I post a lot about automation, ChatGPT, Power Automate, Desktop. Try to click Save now here, close the Excel book, and then try to run the automation once more. Now we are launching Excel, reading it from it, and closing it. And right now, what I want to see here is that over to the left, and here you can also see that my Excel is a little bit slow. That's just sometimes how it is here in the editor. I want to show you that there's nothing wrong with your automation. It happens once in a while. It's only here in the editor, and that's just because the Excel is a little bit slow. So let me fast forward uh, till it stops. 
That's it. Mine took like one minute. And what I see over here to the right is 31 rows and three columns. I read the incorrect sheet, and that's because it was the last active. But imagine that I wanted to automate this in production, then it's not convenient that we cannot refer to the correct sheet. Let's imagine that a colleague opens up another sheet, saves it, and then automation crashes, or even worse, calculates on the wrong numbers. So what I can do here is to click close. Then we want to say, I want to read the position sheet. And again, I'll create a variable for this. So I'll find a set variable and have it up here. All variables where uh, things can change, or if I use it multiple times, I put those one in the beginning of my flow. That means that they're easy to come back to and change. So we will give it a name. We will call this one active sheet and call this position. Then we will say, once we have opened up the Excel book, we will say set active Excel worksheet and drag it in here. We are working in the Excel instance and we're activating the worksheet with the name. Yes, we could have just say position here, but because this worksheet name could change, then we prefer to use a variable for it. So now I can just refer to the active sheet, which has the value position. So it's literally the same. We're just using a variable for it now. Now um, we have uh, this going for us. This means that we will activate the sheet called position. And once we have read it, you can see again over here, we have 10 rows and eight columns. I will again fast forward till the end of this automation. That's it. So what I see over here is that we have, if I double click here, we have read the correct data. Now I want to do browser work because let me again open this data table. Now I want to iterate each one of these assets. I can probably use the ticker, look that up in, for example, Google Finance, scrape the data and write it back to the correct place. So let's do the browser work. First, let's open up a browser. And here I want you to navigate to google.com forward slash finance and hit enter. This is the page that we want to automate. Here I can do the searches. For example, I can search for MSFT, that will be Microsoft. Then I can hit enter. And we have the Microsoft stock price, which is 409.11. Want to extract that data and write it back to Excel. Again, one step at a time. You can see it also, it's live at the moment. That's fine. We will build an automation that gets the data right in the moment, even though it shifts. So what I want to do first is to grab this URL up here like this. So I mark it and say control C. Then I want to open up the browser. I want to do the searches and then we'll do the web scraping afterwards. So again, one step at a time. I will use this URL. Um, it can change. I will use it at least two times. And once I want to use a URL at least two times in a flow, it's often a great idea to make a variable. So again, I'll find a set variable. It's not necessary, but it's best practice. So again, I can drag it in here to my starting variables. I will call this one URL. Control V, paste in the URL, say save. Now we're going to launch a new browser. So go find it, launch and pick your favorite browser. This is the only action where we use different actions. If you choose Firefox or Edge, and the rest of the actions will be exactly the same. I choose Chrome and put it in right here before launch Excel. We're going to launch a new instance and then the URL. We created a variable for this. So here I double click the URL. We can refer to, we can refer to this URL and that will get you this value. The window state will again be normal. Fine. You can also choose maximize if you want to see it maximized. Then the variables produced is called browser. So we can refer to this variable when we want to automate in this browser instance. Oh, then we click save. Now, what I want to do if I have this Google Finance open, then I want to automate this one here. I want to do some searches in case I don't have it open. Then it can sometimes be, it takes a long time if I need to either do it manually or run the entire automation. I can set what we call a breakpoint. So if I click this launch Excel, that means that when I click run now, it will open, it will only perform the first four actions. And then once it reaches here, 
it will pause before it performs it. That means that I now have it open. I can go back to the flow, click stop. I can click here to remove the breakpoint again. So this is a great way to just run a, a, portion, a portion of your flow. But what we are going to do is to iterate the Excel data. This Excel data was the table here, so that is position Excel data. And then we want to iterate each row and do something similar to each row. So we want to repeat the process. Here, go find a reach and drag it in below here. The value to iterate, that will be the data table that we just mentioned, the position Excel data. And now you can see, let me click this X. Now it's convenient that we have named our variables well, then it's easy to figure out which one is which. Then there's store into, that is because we do the iteration for each one of these rows. So then we can give it a reference name. We can pick the names ourselves. It doesn't have to be a certain name. I will just call this one current stock as it is stock in each one of these rows. You can also say current row, current item also works. But again, current stock describes the data that's in that row. I'll say save. So now we iterate through it. What do I want to do? Well, I want to move to this position Excel data. Then each row it will be stored in this current stock. And then I want to refer to the ticker column. That's where we have this MSFT and APPL, I think Apple is, and so forth. We can do the searches. To do, when we want to type on a web page, we find a populate text field on web page. And here we're working in the browser instance, that is fine. Then we will create a UI element. A UI element is just something you see on the screen, either on a web page or in an application. So if I click here, I'll add a UI element. And then when I'm in the browser, you can see that these there are red borders around elements that I can interact with. Since we're going to interact with this input text, I choose this one. So once this is read, I press control on my keyboard. I left click with the mouse and we have created a UI element. Fine. Then I also want to say, what do I want to type here? Yes, I could of course say MSFT, but what would happen here is that it will type MST, MSFT for all 10 iterations. Not nice. No, we want to go into the, the current row we call that one current stock, we'll click the sex, double click the current stock. I also want to say which column where the data is. I can use the ticker or the name. To find a ticker, I'll say a hard bracket, single quotation mark, then I'll say ticker, single quotation mark, and a hard bracket. So here we are typing in this current stock ticker, and I click save. Let me also show you one more thing. So if I go back here, that means that if I type one stock in here, MSFT, and then I want to click enter. We haven't made that yet. That means that this search bug is gone, is gone, but there's another one up here, but it's placed differently. That means that this got most likely another address. So what I want to do after each one of these searches, I want to move back to the front page. That means that I can either go back or simply just move back to the URL once more. Then we are on the front page. So at the first of each one of these iterations, I want to find a go to web page and drag it in here. We will test it in two minutes. So here I can just navigate to the URL. We stored that URL in a variable. So I can just click this X, scroll a little bit down if you don't see it to the URL, double click it. We have it here. So yes, we are navigating, we are opening a browser in this URL, and then the first time we are navigating to it again. But after that, we will just navigate to the front page for each one of these iterations. Then we also need to copy what we human do. When we did, when we done this search, I can either click here on this element, or I can simply just send an enter click on my keyboard to move inside here. But there's a trap here, and that is nice to see. So if I go back, if I'm, here and I've typed in MSFT, I can click enter here. But if I click away and try to click enter, it will not perform the search. In a populate text field on web page, per default Power Automate Desktop takes the focus away from this search box. That also means that I will need to go into the populate text field on web page, go in advanced, and unclick this unfocused text box after filling it. Then I click save. Now we can send the enter click. Usually you can also click on the search button, but there's no search button present here. 
So what I want to do here is just, just to find a send keys here and drag it in after the populate text field on web page. So here we're just sending into the foreground window. I want to insert special key. I'll uh, find it in the miscellaneous here. You can see I can insert a space or an enter. And then we have the shortcut for an enter click that will be return in curly brackets. We could of course have written it ourselves, but again, we are lazy. Then I click save. Now I want to test it once more. And this time I just set a breakpoint here at the end. Then we can see for each one of these iterations that we're actually navigating to the correct stock and we don't have to navigate to all 10 stocks. By the way, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Anna Jensen, a Microsoft most valuable professional in Power Automate. I use Power Automate each day and yes, it is my favorite tool. That's it. So we navigated into the Apple and we got that price. That also means that if I click run once more, you will see here in the background that it populates and then we're in the Microsoft. Now for each one of these iteration, we want to extract some data. So I go up here and click stop. And again, uh, I can choose to remove the breakpoint, but let's just uh, let it be for now. So what I want to do to extract data, then I want to find and extract data from web page and make sure you pick the one here on the web data extraction. We want to uh, put it after the send keys after we have made the search. So again, we are in the browser. To activate this, you need to open up this stock where we can find the price. So here we have it in here the diff element. Once I'm happy with the selection, which is here, make sure it's red, then you can right click and here you can say extract element value. And this will not create an address based on the actual value, but the elements place place in the HTML code. So it will create a selector. And here you can see uh, this green border around it and we can click finish. Let me just do this. Uh, right now it's called variables produced. Let's give it a better name. I will call this one stock price and click save. I can also choose to right now you can see here we have a couple of browsers open. We want to as automation developers, we also want to clean up after ourselves. That means that we want to close programs again. So let's just find a close web browser and drag it in here in the end after the for each. This will just close the browser instance. That's it. So now we can run and inspect it again. What I want to inspect now that is will be the stock price. I already know that up here this works. So I want to inspect the stock price variable after we have done the search. So we're going to the web page. We are populating the text field. Here we are performing the web extraction. And if I click stop on the automation, what I want to inspect over here in the flow variables, that's the stock price. If I double click here over here, one rows and one columns, we see that we have the results, which is fine. It is in a data, data table though, and that is just a way an extract data from web page works. This also mean that if I want to uh, refer to this, this is in a table format, I need to say, I want the first row, and again, that's index zero, it's programming, so it's zero indexed. It's also the zeroth index column, so the next one would have been one. So I can refer to this data, this value down here as the stock price and then zero, zero. I also want to get rid of this dollar sign, sign, and that's because I don't use that in my Excel sheet. That's usually what happens when we get data from one system. Here's a web page. That is, it's in a different format that we don't use. So let's get rid of this. And what I want to do here is to have a get subtext here and have it right after the extract value. So I will do this for each one of the extractions in this for each. The original text that will be the stock price. So I double click here. And then I wanted to say 0, 0.0. It actually might work in a one time one data table just by writing stock price. 
But for best practice, let's refer to that correct cell by saying 0, 0.0. Sometimes you will have more cells or columns in, or more rows or columns in your data table. Then I want to say, I want to start from the second position. I want to get rid of the dollar sign. That's how it is in all these scrapings. And again, it's zero index, so that will be position one, as the first position is position zero. The length here, that will be the end of text. I will just scrape, I will just get the text, whatever, how long it is. If it's a really long, big number, I want everything. Then we can write it back to the stock price variable. That means that it's a data table up here, and then once we have gotten the subtext, it will return a text variable. You can do this in Power Automate Desktop. The variables are not uh, definitive, so you can change from a data table down here to a text value. I can click Save. I also want to save this stock price for each one of these iterations back to our Excel. So I go to my folder. So here in case A, Let's create an output folder, and that's because I want to have a folder to put in my output. So I right click here, say new folder. Here I'll say output. That's the folder where I want to um, save to. So after we have gotten this stock price, we need to save it to Excel in the correct cell. We know that it's column. Let me just open it again here in the input. We know that it's column. D. So that one we know, but there's no link between the data table and the Excel. So for the row number, I just need to say, well, if I'm in data table row index zero, then I'm in index two or row two here in the Excel. To do so, we're creating a helping variable. So find a set variable and drag it in in front of the for each. We will call this one row number, and this is just to keep track of where we are in our iteration. I know that the first iteration of the freeze that will be the zero index, that will be index zero in the data table, that corresponds to row number two in Excel. So here I will have a tracker that tracks where I'm at, at relative to the Excel row numbers. Then you'll find an increase variable and drag it in in the end of the for each. This variable name, we're going to increase the row number by one. So pick the row number here in the variable picker and say increase by one. Now we can write back to the Excel. And what we will do here is to find an A write to Excel worksheet, drag it in, in, in front of the increase. That's very important, not after it. So what are we going to write? Well, we're going to write the stock price. So click this little X here, double click the stock price. We're going to write on a specified cell. We know that it was the D column, and we also know that the row number varies. So for each iteration, we want to use the row number, and that one will change. So it will be in the correct position in this Excel sheet. Then I click Save. Now when you run it, you could think that you have written it to the Excel worksheet, but actually we haven't saved it yet. So what I want to do is let us just remove this breakpoint. I want to take this close Excel market, then drag it all the way down to just before the close web browser. And then I want to create a variable uh, for the path that I'm going to save. I'm creating a variable for this because uh, I'm going to reuse it several times. I'm not going to create it up here. That's not necessarily. I can just create it down here. And that's because it will only change in the flow. So I can have it here before the close Excel. This, let's call this, sorry, out put Excel path. And let's talk about where we want uh, this to be outputted to. So I need, I know I need to put it in the project path. And then I also need to put it in the output folder. We will add a couple of things to this later on. But for now, this is fine. So and then I could actually also add it right now the Excel book name instead of having it in the close Excel. So I'll have the op updated port folio.xlsx and I click Save. 
This is the part where I want to uh, the path where I want to save it. And let me just double click it again. So I combine it with the project path. Then I move inside the output and then I pick the Excel book name. Then open the close Excel right below. Say save document as. And here we use the newly created variable called output Excel path. Now you can click save. And let's just save the flow for all time sakes, just so if the computer crashes, hopefully it won't, it's re really uh, rarely my computer crashes, then we will click done. Now we will do 10 iterations where we will do searches. I will fast forward to the end here. So let me come back. Now we are almost done. And please, if this video helps you, please give the video a thumbs up. That will really help me and my channel a lot. I have a dream about making a living out of this YouTube. So your like will help me a lot. Thank you. Now we are at the last iteration. We saw that it closed and let us go back here. We're not in the input, so let us go back to the output. Here we can see we have the updated portfolio and now bingo. We have the current price nicely written in on the correct places. Then you might see that um, when you try to open up this Excel book, that it's grayed out. So everything here is great. If that's the case, that's just a minor Windows bug. To solve this, if it's gray really, and it's not giving you an error message, that's important. Then you can double click this Excel and choose to make instance visible. Then you unfortunately got a, a, a an unlucky computer or Windows instance. So you need to do this each time you automate with Power Automate Desktop. I don't have it, so I can just leave this unchecked. In case this one is completely locked, that means that it says an error message that you can only open it as read only or something is wrong or with your input. Then the way to solve it is to go to start search for and this is a general one if your power to make desktop locks the excel instance then i can go to the powershell i can right click when i click run as administrator my screen goes a little bit black until i click yes and i'm in powershell and please bookmark this because this will be important for you when you want to force close your excel when power to make desktop sometimes accidentally locks it you can also restart your computer or sometimes use your task manager but this is the bulletproof solution. I'll write task kill, which means that we will kill the task either by an image or a pin number. Here I'll say I'll do it by force. So even if the program doesn't respond, I will just completely shut it down. This also means that it will shut down all your Excel instances. So if you have anything open, please save it. I'll say a forward slash and I want to say I want to close an image. I want to close the image called excel.exe. Right now I don't have any Excel instances open. But imagine I had, it could look like this. And once I click enter here, let me just come back to here. Now it disappeared. Um, let me just write it again. So uh, that's uh, with these live codings. I hope you enjoy them, but uh, and sometimes they just uh, like this. Then I click enter, you can see that my Excel book in the background closed. That's nice. So that's the way to solve when an Excel book locked. Usually when I automate Excel, at least when I develop, I just have this minimized because then I can come back. I can just use the up arrow to find the command again, hit enter again. Right now it cannot find any Excel.exit. That makes sense. So minimize it and have it right here in your taskbar. So if I ran this automation once more, that means that it would override this updated portfolio here. It will, so we want some types of type of a prefix. So we just have unique outputs each time. So it doesn't um, um, overwrite these things. We can use a, a date timestamp. So I can use the year, uh, month, days, hour, minute, seconds in front of this updated portfolio. So what I want to do here is in front of this set variable, I want a get current date and time and drag it in. This will take the current date and time once your Power Automate desktop flows reaches this point. So here I can click save. And then I want to convert a date time to text. So here I say convert date time to text and drag it in. That is because it is a date time variable. 
And I want to use this date time variable in a text format that will be my file path. I need to convert it and I also need to convert it to a standard that I can use. Um, it, a file path doesn't accept colons or slashes. So the date time to convert, that will be the current date time. Here in the format, choose custom. That is because we can custom the format just as we want. Here I want four Y's, two M's, two D's, a hyphen. Let me move the mouse. Two big H's, that's hours in 24 hour format. That's nice when we want to sort. Then I want minutes and seconds. This is, by the way, the .NET custom date time format string. So, and if I want to know more about this and how I write these things out, then you can search for .NET custom date time format. Then you choose this one here, custom date, date and time format .NET. Scroll a little bit down and this is how you use these letters here. It's the same in Excel. For example, two big M's, that's the month from one to 12. I can choose to also have, for example, three F's, small F's, that's uh, milliseconds if I wanted that. For now, it's good. Now you know where you can find more information about this. This variable is getting saved in a variable called formatted date time. I click save here. Now I want to use this formatted date time in my output Excel path. So I double click to open it. I want it as a prefix to my file name. So here in the updated portfolio, I click this X, double click the formatted date time, and let's also place an underscore outside the percentage sign. So now I have a time stamp. Here I click save. That also means that if I run this automation once more, we will not have this overwritten. We will create a unique Excel book, um, at least a unique name, and that's convenient. So we never overwrite a log or anything else. And it's also nice that um, we have a timestamp. So let's say that we build a log, then it will also be unique. So never delete a log or at least have a rule for that. In case you want more help with all of this, then I created a Discord community called I Love Automation. Here we are 11,000 RPA developers networking around our careers, helping each other with solutions. It's 100% free to join and the link is right below here in the description. So we are uh, soon done. I always, uh, I think it's so satisfying to see my automation run even, I mean, year five or six as an RPA developer and also use auto hotkey before that. But this is so satisfying to see the mouse or the typings and all these things and also see the Excel books that's getting created here. So now we are, we are closed. If I go to the folder, I can now see that I have this timestamp here. This is very nice. Of course, the data is the same, or at least the current price might have went a little bit up or down. Um, but so mission accomplished. Now I want to do Excel calculations. So this means that in here for each one of these current stocks, I wanted to calculate, let me show you what I want to calculate. The total cost, that is buying price times quantity. Market value, that will be current price times quantity. And again, profit loss, that will be market value minus total cost. I want to make these calculations for each one of these rows. It's very important to know how to calculate stuff in Excel with Power Automate Desktop or just calculate in general with Power Automate Desktop. We have 22 actions. Already now we can see that we have a lot of actions and imagine that we create more now, then it can be a little bit hard to see what's going on here. We can structure them a little bit better. One of the ways that we can do it is by a region. Let me move this region in here. We will move it after this right to Excel worksheet. We will call our region Excel calculations and then click save. This region um, just stores some actions. The region itself, like the, the two yellow ones, they will get ignored at runtime. So this is just to structure your flow better. Let me show you how smart it is because now we can drag actions in here. And yes, they will be performed just like in other actions. So it's only to, um, to make it a little bit more clean 
looking, and that will also uh, mean that it's easier to maintain when we come back to the flow. Let's first, uh, we need to convert these elements to numbers. So the elements that we have here in the current stock, even though that this buying price and the quantity, they look like numbers. They are text in um, Power Automate Desktop, meaning that's because they come from a data row in the data table. So we need to convert them to rows before we can calculate on them. The same with the stock price. So I'll have a convert text to number like this. The first thing I want to convert to a number is the buying price. The buying price lies in the data row called current stock. So I go up here, click the X, click current stock, go inside here, and then I want the header in hard brackets and a single quotation mark. So here I'll say buying price in here. So this will be the buying price. I will also say variables produce, produced, that will be buying price. You cannot have spaces in variables for several reasons. Um, so you need to have it non-spaced. So this is the buying price, click save. And again, we are lazy, we need to calculate two more, uh, we need to have two more convert text to numbers. So just click here, say control C, control V two times. Yes, we have repeated it three times. So now let me move inside the second one. Well, now we want the stock price. Yeah, that could be, uh, so we only saved a little bit of time. I delete all this. Then I just click the X, stay stock price. Down here in buying price, find the stock price once more. So we're just converting stock price into a number and saving it to the same variable. And again, if you click here, you can also see the percentage signs. I can click save. Then in the third one, we want the quantity. One comes from the data row. So here I'll say quantity. Make sure I spell right, otherwise it won't work. So here I have the quantity, quantity, like this. Now we can do our three calculations and write them back to Excel. Let's take the first one. So I'll have a write to Excel worksheet and drag it in underneath here. We're working in the Excel instance. So the value to write, the first one, and let us just repeat what we wanted. The first one that was in column F, then we have the GH, and here we want total cost, market value, and profit lost. So let's wait a bit with the value to write. We know that we were in column F. We also know that the row number, that one is stored here in the row number, so I can also fill that one here. And then I just need the value to write. To find the cost, I need to times buying price with quantity. I created two variables for those here. So I just click the X and say buying price. To make a calculation in Power Automate Desktop, I need to move inside two percentage signs. That also means all the variables inside a code block that's surrounded by percentage signs. We don't need to have more percentage signs around these. So I can say times with an asterisk click this X, and then I also wanted the quantity, double click here. And then, as I said, we need to remove these two percentage signs. So this is the calculation. I can click save. Then we are repeating this one two times, so almost. So mark it again, so it turns gray. Control C on your keyboard, Control V two times. Move inside here. Now I'm in G, and the calculation now that will be the market value. So instead of buying price, that will be the stock price times quantity. Here and here, and click save. Then for the last one, that will be uh, column H. And now I want to say buying price, uh, stock price times quantity minus buying price times quantity. So I already have something here. So what I can say here is to find the stock price. Again, I'll remove these percentage sign. Then I'll have space. When I uh, have spaces in these calculations, they will just get ignored by runtime. So let me just say stock price, I mean times, quantity, and again, remove these. And then I want a minus here. Oh, sorry. 
I think I have the insert one. Uh, um, accidentally clicked here. So now I have the stock price times quantity minus buying price times quantity. I could uh, set a parenthesis around uh, stock price and buying price and only have quantity once, but for now, this is fine. If you get an error here, that means that you have just uh, misspelled something or you have a percentage signs too much, go back and fix it after this. Again, let us save it. Let's try to run the automation once more. We will uh, wait a few seconds and then we can click run. When we come back here, then of course we will inspect that the calculations have finished well, but I also want to show you how to use the copilot. That means that when we don't have enough, enough actions in Power Automate Desktop, then we might use want to use code that could be VB script, Visual Basic Script, Python, or PowerShell, but we might not know any code. This is a low code tool, but with Copilot, I can just use my own words. I don't need to know any code to automate this. So I will show you, I'll just fast forward till the end of this iteration. That's it, that was the last part here. I will close the web browser. Let's just first inspect the result. And here you can say that, um, it um, we, it had created a new Excel book. So if I do this, here we have it. We have the total cost, we have the market value and a profit loss, nicely calculated. Now I want to create a chart. I cannot do this natively with Power Automate Desktop Actions. So here I want to use a script. Let's say that I don't know anything about scripting or coding. I do, but yes, it takes a long time for me as well. So we can automate this with Copilot. I want a pie chart of the market value column with the labels over here. And I want it to be placed here so it doesn't um, it doesn't cut shade uh, for any of the data. So I want it to be placed in the I column. Let's go create that and let's do it with the co-pilot. So when we do this after this close Excel, we will run the script on the data. So that means we need to have the data first and then we can run the script. So go over here, find a run VB, sorry, that's my spelling, run VB script, visual basic script. Move it down below the close Excel. Here I could of course put in the script, but click this generate script with copilot. Here, with our own words, we can describe what we want to have a script of. So here I say, read all data in a specific sheet in an Excel file. This uh, understands a wall of text, but I sometimes just like to do this to structure it for myself. Then I want to say, create, oh, sorry, create a pie chart of column G data, use column A for labels. Then I also want to have a titled market value that will be the pie chart. And here I can say start chart from column I. And I also want to say uh, save, close and quit Excel. Um, just to have Excel closed conveniently. Then I say generate, then it will take like five seconds. And we will have a script ready and or maybe 10 seconds. Here we go. If I just move this a little bit up, do this. Here we have a script. And here we can see something that we use a path. We also have a sheet that we're working in and we have a pie chart here. Let's say that it also have uh, some comments here. It might be that I want to add something that I'm not satisfied with this code. Let's say that I have some knowledge. I can click regenerate. I know I don't have uh, changed something, but it will still make a new prediction. So here you will see that it is someone changed. It still has has these these two placeholders, but let's say I'm, I can click regenerate a lot of times, it will make predictions. That's how a large language model works, which this is based on. Let's say I'm happy, I can say use this script. And now you can see, I just need to fill out this placeholder for the Excel path and the sheet name. I can do this by either 
hard coding in, but since we have created variables, this one here, that will be the output Excel path, that one we just saved here to this part. And by the way, the date time is fixed, so it's not changing through each one of these actions. We took that one up here, if you're thinking about that. So here I say output Excel path, make sure you have the quotation marks. The sheet, mark that, go up and find the active sheet. That's all we need to change. Sometimes we will have to work a little bit with these scripts, but usually it's not um, something I need to worry about. I can just click save here and let's go test it and run the automation. I will again fast forward uh, so we don't need to see 10 iterations. I'll just fast forward to the VB script running. Here we have the second last that will be Johnson and Johnson. And now we will have the Paramount. Yes, we know the stocks, uh, I think it's the fifth iteration now in this project. So here we're running the VB script and then we're closing the web browser. If I go back to my last Excel book, here we have it in column I, we have a nice pie chart of our data with the labels on. So far, so good. Now I want to make sure that this uh, nice sheet is sent directly to my Outlook inbox. So let me just don't save it. So now I want to save this one here. Each time this robot runs, I want to send an Outlook email. Here I want to include some nice uh, date time. And I don't want to use this formatted date time here for the file. So let's do another conversion. So here I want to find a convert date time to text. This is just to get it in another format so I can use it in my email so it looks nice. I'm still using the current date time. I'm taking the custom and then I want to uh, think about how I want to format this. That could be, for example, months, oh, sorry, days, years, then hours in a 12 hour format months, a uh, minutes and seconds, sorry. And I want to save it in formatted date time, email, when I click save here. So now I have some timestamps here, and this could be a great time to introduce a comment again. Comments were to explain different uh, difficult parts in our flow. They will again get ignored in runtime. Sometimes when you search for something, it doesn't show up, it will be in this category, so you can find it here and I will go down here. What this does is that we can say generate two timestamps for file naming and uh, like this, and then we say first for file naming and uh, second for email. Then I can click save. One other thing that I see here is that now I have a formatted date time for email, I named that one well, and then we have a formatted date time. I want to call this format uh, date time for, um, for file. And this is by the way, an, action, an error we see sometimes in Power to My Desktop, just close it. So now I want to rename this, but then I need to rename it in several actions. The best way to do this is to go over here to find a formatted date time, right click on it, say rename, then you want to say for file, that means that when I click enter here, it will get updated everywhere in the flow. So that is a more bulletproof way. I want to launch an Outlook. So let's go up here in the initialization phase and we can have an Outlook up here. So before the edge, I will have a launch Outlook here and drag it in here. So launch the new Chrome. We're launching an Outlook instance, we're clicking save. So I want to have all my initialization, all the opening programs in the beginning, then it's a more natural flow. Then after this close Excel, you will find a send, send email message to Outlook. Make sure you pick the right one. Oh, sorry, after this VB script, we can attach, uh, we can send the email and attach the file. So here it's the Outlook instance. And again, here I'll say account, that will be your data account, most likely your email, or otherwise you can check in Outlook. 
Here I want to send it to someone. I just pick myself. Usually that will be some someone else. If I use this twice, I also said that if I use a, a value twice in the flow, I need to create a variable. So let's go do that just to make sure that we always practice these. I know it's annoying sometimes and um, just do it because uh, if you force yourself to it, your flows will be much more stable. This one we will call email address. And here I will call this one Anders at andersjensen.org. You should, of course, use another email so you don't bombard me with an email. If you like this video, you're more than welcome to send me uh, an email and tell me. So here I can use this email address down here in the send email message to Outlook. Now we just do this one here. We will have this one here. And then we have a subject. You can choose whatever you want. You can say your portfolio bot ran. And then we can have a body. Then we can say the port folio bot ran on and then we have a timestamp and again i can format this exactly like i want this one was for the file this one was for the email let's say let's say attached is your updated port folio and then i need to in attachments i need to attach a file we already have that. We have that here in the output Excel path. So I just click this X here. I'll say output Excel path and click save. Now we're also sending an email. So let's go save it before we test it. And uh, soon we have a really cool flow. I will start the flow and then I will come back to the end when we reach Paramount. So we don't uh, see this for the sixth time. See you. I'm back, we're searching for Paramount. And what we want to see is that we don't get an error in the flow and we are sending the email message. So the first thing is accomplished. Let me move to my other screen. And here I have the email. Um, here it says that the po portfolio but ran. We have a timestamp. And here we have an attachment, which is um, the updated current prices and the calculations along with a pie chart. So far, so good. Let us move on to the second part of this. Let me also close this of this exercise. And that is to work with files. Now, if I go here, then if I go to project, I also have a case B. And here in the input, I have portfolio one. That is the, like the data that you just saw. I also have a portfolio two with just five stocks in it, but it's, it follows the same structure with the same um, column names. I can take all files in this one here, and then I can say I want to uh, do the same. So for the portfolio one and portfolio two, I want to do all of this. So what is it that I want to do? Well, I'd only want to launch Outlook once. I only want to launch Chrome once. But here I want to launch Excel. I want to launch an Excel book called Portfolio 1 and Portfolio 2. I also want to, if we had a Portfolio 3 someday, I also make, want to make it work there. So first thing, go up here and change the case A to case B and click Save. Now I want to get all the files in that input folder. So I go up here and then I say get files in folder. It's here. I want to um, have it right after. So right after the launch new Chrome, but before the launch new Excel, the folder where I want to grab the files, that will be the project path. And then in the input folder. Here, I could also say I want to have a file filter that wants to probably sometimes I just want to just have the Excel files that will make sense here. But let's just uh, let it be. We only have Excel files in that folder, so it will work for now. But you can make filters. Then we can include subfolders if we had any. This will get stored into a list called files. So it's a list of file names. And when I click Save here, 
we can try test that it actually works. So if I set a breakpoint here in launch Excel, again, these breakpoints are excellent, so we don't need to run the entire automation. And when I click run here, you will see that we open Chrome and then we get the files and folder. I can close Chrome. I can stop this. And what I want to inspect is this files variable. So click the files over here. And there you go. We have portfolio one and we have portfolio two. Now we can iterate to this list and just repeat all the actions over and over. So we can make an outer for each. Let me close this and let me move this. So I want to have it for each starting here before the launch Excel. So find a for each. And again, you can find it up here. I have it here. And the value to iterate, that will be the files, double click here. And then I want the call it current file. This is again a reference name that uh, reference to the file that we're currently iterating. I'll click save. Now I want all these actions inside this for each, but I could, of course, drag them in. The easiest way is to click the end, go all the way down. Uh, just before the close web browser, I want to have it uh, here. So then uh, what I then want to do is to um, talk a little bit about uh, what file we're opening. Now we're not opening the portfolio. Now we're opening the current file. That will be the file name. So I will delete all of this and just have the current file. I accidentally pressed caps locked here. Current file and click save. I also want to say, well, now I don't want to call it updated portfolio. Now I want to have whatever is the current file, whatever that file name is without the extension, that will be portfolio one for the first time and portfolio two. Then I want to call it that. So let me go in here. So instead of we're using a variable for this, this is convenient since we are using it in the close Excel, run VB script and send email to Outlook. So I just need to change it here. So instead of this updated portfolio, delete this, then I can click this X, scroll a little bit up to current file, expand it. And here you can find name without a current file name without extension. Here we have the file name without an ending. So now we're combining a lot of stuff, but this will get it right. I'll click save. So now we do the iteration and we're also giving it the right name. I also want to, whenever I iterate it through a file, that will mean the out of for each year, then I want to move that file into another folder. That is just to not have to process the same uh, Excel file twice. Imagine that th these files are automatically getting placed there by a colleague or another automation process. So let's create a processed folder like this. And that's also mean that in the end of the out of for each that will be here, we will move the current file into this processed folder. So here we are saying move files here. So now we're working with the files, have it here. And then the files to move, click this little X, pick the current file. So that one will move the current file. Where do I want to move it? Well, I want to move it into the project path. I'll have a backward slash. And then I will say processed. If the file exists, I can choose to override. It most likely will because we have a timestamp. Uh, we're not having a timestamp, but it most likely will if we're just moving these files over and over. The variables produced called move files. I'm not going to use that, so untick it. Best practice is to untick the variables that you're not going to use. Now I can click save. Let's go test it. So let me save this. And let us try run it. What I want to see here that it starts well that we can uh, do the searches for the first file that we can actually uh, here we have the first one that this will be the same one as before. So I'll fast forward till we come to the next Excel book and also see this works. And by the way, if you haven't liked this video yet, please do so it will help me so much. Thank you. Let's fast forward. Now we are at the paramount. So it will be exciting to see if we can actually move this file. 
And now we're running the VB script for this. We're moving the file and here we go. We're opening up the portfolio too. Now we should search for some different stocks. Here we have the Walmart. It looks like this works. So we have created an automation that now can take multiple files and move each, uh, each time uh, a file is processed, then we move it to a processed folder. We still need to check for this. We only have five stocks in here, so uh, we will stay. And now we have the Intel Corp. I think this is iteration three or four. Coca-Cola, KO, that's the shortening. Here we have it. And we will check a couple of things. So it closed down without errors. First uh, thing, that's nice. Then we move to the folder. Now I want to see that I have portfolio one and two here in the process. So far, so good here. And what I also want to see is that, um, and now you can actually see here, we're moving the current file into these process. That is fine. And we also have it in the output. And then I also want to see that I'm getting sent two emails. I have them here. So now I have two emails each sent with, so this one is the first one. I can check it there. We already saw this worked. This works. And this works. Isn't it nice? You have completed a complete guide on Power Automate Desktop. Now you want to learn best practices. In this advanced guys, guide, you and I will build a complete flow that will teach you all the best practices. See you there.